All right, well, glad to see everybody back for part three. I didn't lose anybody. Um, that's always, uh, it's always a good sign, I guess, in some sort of ways. Um, we're on part three. We're on marriage, and I'm going to do pretty much the same thing that I've done, start with the same format, but just fill in the blanks uh, with things pertaining to marriage now as we're on uh, a biblical theology of marriage. So first, uh, why this series? Answering the question, and in particular now, why this topic? Uh, first of all, there's an increasing need to address these issues for Christians and by Christians in the light of changing social norms. What are these changing social norms? Well, there is the normalization of prolonged singleness to avoid marriage. Okay, uh, a couple of months ago, Ross Duthat, he is a columnist for the New York Times, he put out an article uh, concerning uh, this idea of delayed marriage, and, and he identified uh, uh, something that he said was called delayed marriage preceded by romantic experimentation. Delayed marriage preceded by romantic experimentation. And in our culture, in our time, where does this start? I have to say, right, because I, because I work with kids and, and I guess just kind of growing up too, that seems to start, you know, in a sense uh, when we're young, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, as kids, you know, we have to say it as kids, we try to get into these long-term relationships when you're still a kid, right? And so you're experimenting with all these romantic ideas and we want to live out what we see in the cartoons. We want to live out what we see in the movies. You know, Disney's been telling us for years, you know, you're a prince or you're a princess. And we want to try to live that out. And uh, sometimes, you know, this what Duthat's point was, was that people try to live that out a little too long. <laughs> They try to live it out a little too long, and, and so they prolong, uh, they prolong their singleness, uh, but yet they're willing to at least experiment uh, with romantic feelings, with romantic relationships to kind of get their feet wet, but they don't want to jump in completely. Uh, another changing social norm that we've all known about for a long time is the normalization of divorce. I mean, nowadays, it, it used to be, right, that getting a divorce was taboo. <gasps> You know, and, and nowadays it's just, oh, yeah, 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 I've got three of them already, you know, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, it's, it's that normal now. You know, it, it's very, very normal to hear about that. Uh, the, the divorce rate is twice the rate than it was in 1960 today, okay? Uh, these are 2011 steps. Uh, in 1970, 89% of all births were to married parents. Today, only 60% are. In 1960, 72% of American adults were married. Today, or at least as of 2008, 50% married. So you can see the decline in marriage itself has just been slowly but steadily happening. There's also the normalization of the pessimism or disdain for marriage. You know, a more and more common law marriage seems to be the norm. Hey, let's just move in together. You know, oh, shouldn't we be married? No, 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 it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing, just move in. Just do it that way, you know? Uh, the secularization of the purpose of marriage uh, about our own personal happiness, that seems to be the norm of what marriage is for. Marriage seems to be just another way to find personal happiness. And, that can, and as we'll see in a little bit, that can either include the other person or it can be at the expense of the other person. There's also with that uh, the redefinition of marriage. And we'll mention it while we still can, while we still have the freedom to talk about it. We have to say that, right? The redefinition of marriage to include a man and a man and a woman and a woman, or if you haven't heard, yourself. <laughs> okay, apparently some woman in Houston uh, made a deal with herself. This is for real, right? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Apparently she made a deal that if she hit 40 and she didn't marry anybody, she was going to marry herself. <laughs> Apparently she was able to go down to the court and marry herself. Pretty ridiculous, but uh, a society is, is, is growing a, or, or is changing in such a way that it has no problem redefining marriage. I mean, people are really out there. I want to marry my computer. Some kid in Florida, I want to marry my computer. You know, some people, I want to marry my pets, you know, and all you know, all sorts of other perverse stuff. But, I mean, marriage really is being challenged. And, I mean, and the horrible thing, right, you know, people who are uh, for homosexual marriage, they use the term marriage equality. And if they're really for marriage equality, then they can't have any problems with people marrying whoever they want. Marriage equality means I get to marry equally. So that's, you know, that's something that, that, that certainly needs to be considered in our time. Uh, another thing is that we have to learn the Christian purpose 
for marriage. Again, these things don't just naturally come into our mind when we become Christian or when you start attending a Christian church. They don't just, the knowledge is not infused. You have to learn. You have to be trained. You have to be taught what the Bible says about Christian marriage. And third, uh, increasing secular influences. And I've talked about music before. Probably not so much with marriage this time, but what does influence is media. Uh, I'll give away my age a little bit, right? I, I grew up watching Arnold Schwarzenegger movies a lot, okay? And uh, one of the movies that I remember seeing was True Lies. You know, and how do they portray marriage in the movie True Lies? It's dull, and it's boring. And so what does Arnold have? He, ha he has his job on the side where he finds all of his real adventure and real excitement, right? It's not in marriage. It's in his, it's in his CIA job that he has, you know, being a spy, being an agent. Um, so we have, to, we have to consider those things. Those are the things that influence uh, what, we think, uh, what we think about marriage. Uh, Tim, Keller, Tim Keller said this. He said, what God institutes, he also regulates. If God invented marriage, then those who enter it should have every effort to understand and submit to his purposes for it. So that's going to be part of the study today. We're going to go through the creation of marriage. Why did God create marriage? What's it for? Okay, and I'll have a whole bunch of sub points that are basically, I'm, I'm basically going to be giving out like, I don't know, nine sermons in this whole lecture, okay? And each one has three points, okay? No, I'm kidding. But uh, we want to learn why God created marriage, the fall, what happened to marriage, what are the things that we see in marriage today, okay? the redemption of marriage, and the consummation of marriage. So we're going to stick with that same pattern, or our biblical theology pattern. So let's start off with creation. Okay, creation. Uh, in the beginning, God created male and female, and when he pronounced uh, the, uh, the benediction, that is the good word over all of creation, he said that it was all very good. Okay, the first malediction, okay, the first bad uh, the bad word about creation comes in Genesis 2.18 when God says it is not good for man to be alone. Okay, that's the first, in a sense, kind of literary disruptor in this whole, in this whole narrative uh, of God creating things. It's not good for man to be alone. We were not created to be in relationship with God alone. Rather, God created us to need others like us, but who are not us. And he did this by creating male and female. So God created us, to, in a sense, to reflect what he is in himself. God is three persons. He's three persons in one being. He's a trinity. And each person, even though they share in the one substance that is God, each person is distinct. And so God, in creating us, he creates us male and female. We're in the same image of God, but yet we're not exactly the same. We're different uh, we're different in our gender, okay? Uh, something else I did for another study and for another paper that I don't know what I did with it. It's just sitting around. But even the idea of gender, God created gender. God created male and female. Male and female are not some eternal principles that exist in other uh, Middle Eastern religions. Uh, the perfect divine being is androgynous. That is, they, they have ma it has male and female together. But in the Bible, we see that God created male and female. Male and female is not inherent in who God is uh, eternally. He's, he's genderless, technically. Okay? And that's another side issue. But God created male and female. He created us to be in community. And God brings uh, a woman to the man, out of the man, and the man breaks into song and poetry. And, and you see this in Genesis 2. And when he sees Eve, uh, she comes to him. God brings her. Right? God's the first father giving away the bride. And what does Adam say? He says, you know, he's basically like, whoa, he breaks out into song and poetry. You can see this in Genesis 2 if you all want to turn there. But he basically says, you know, you know, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, you shall be called woman, for you came out of man. This is the first place that woman and man are called out, right? Ish, man, and Isha, woman. Okay, basically what Adam did was in seeing the woman, he recognized who he was. He knew who he was by looking at who the woman was. He basically said, again, in, in straight-up Jerry Maguire fashion, you know, in seeing you, I know who I am. You complete me. All right? There it is, Jerry Maguire, okay? But here, God institutes marriage. Okay, God institutes marriage. If you look in Genesis 2, let's go ahead and turn there. In Genesis 2, we, we have this whole account, right? This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. 
Therefore, okay, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, as one reads the Bible, one should pay careful attention to the narrative flow of things, especially in didactic points. In this case, we should ask what the therefore is there for. Okay? Therefore, if you've taken a logic class, is a conclusion indicator. Okay? You usually have a premise, major premise, minor premise, and then conclusion. Okay? Here, the, the word therefore functions as a conclusion indicator, not so much as an argument, but just as a culmination of, uh, uh, of events here. So hence, what we see in verse 24 is the summation of the creation of male and female culminating in the act of marriage. Not losing the flow of the narrative, we see that God has designed marriage as the peak of human relationships between male and female. And so there's a leaving and cleaving, and this is fitting in the relationship that God has created between man and woman. Okay? Now, in order to see this point a bit more clearly, Jesus makes clear what we're asserting up to this point. Okay? In Matthew 19, uh, there's a Pharisee that approaches Jesus. Right? They're trying to trap Jesus in his words. In Matthew 19, uh, starting on verse 3, it says, Pharisee came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and therefore, and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So here we see, uh, at least kind of picking up with Genesis 2 and with Jesus' words, we see the design of marriage. Okay, there is an acknowledgement of the creation of marriage as well as the purpose and design for it. Okay, that's what Jesus says. Have you brought read from the beginning the way God made this? Okay. Uh, there is also the participants of marriage that Jesus lays out, right? He says male and female. And there's also the permanence of marriage that Jesus lays out as well, too. Okay, so note that Jesus does affirm that marriage was designed for male and female. So this is your apologetic point, right? When culture says, well, Jesus never spoke a word against homosexual marriage, he didn't have to, okay? He didn't have to be explicit about it. He just went back to the creation account, and he could prove it right from there, okay? Now, note also that marriage is something that God does. Marriage is something that God does. He says, there it is, it says, therefore, what God has joined together. We should not miss the significance of that statement, what God has joined together. Marriage is not just a mere legal transaction that you pay 80 bucks for a certificate down at the county clerk's office, okay? Uh, rather, it's something that God himself does to the couple that are getting married. God does this. Listen to John Piper comment on this. He says, Genesis 2.24 is God's word of institution for marriage. But just as it was God who took the woman from the flesh of man, it is God who in each marriage ordains and performs a uniting called one flesh. Man does not create this, God does. And it is not in man's power to destroy. When a couple speaks their vows, it is not a man or a woman or a pastor or parent who is the main actor, the main doer. God is. God joins a husband and a wife into a one flesh union. God does that. Now one more thing that we should note is that marriage is a covenant in the Bible. So if you're making an outline here, uh, this would be the essence of marriage. Okay, the essence is marriage. God joins man and woman together by way of a covenant. A covenant in its most fundamental element is a legally binding agreement. Okay, it's a legally binding agreement. It was the way you did contracts back then. It was the way you signed on the dotted line. Of course, back then, in, in some form of way, uh, you didn't sign. What you did was you acted out the covenant curse. 
okay? It, 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 you took a self-maledictory oath is what they call it, okay? Uh, the covenant, or marriage as a covenant, is revealed in Malachi 2.14, which says, but you say, why does he not? So in, in Malachi, the people are asking, you know, God, why come you're not blessing us? You, you promised us all these things. We've rebuilt the temple. We've rebuilt the city walls. We've got Jerusalem up and running. And God, there's still no glory. What's up? And God confronts the people in Malachi, and he tells them, well, you know, you haven't done this. You say that serving me is a burden. How do you expect me to bless you? And then here at this point, God comes to them, and he says, you know, he's going to talk to them about how, the way that they're treating marriage in their society. And he's going to tell them, because you're treating marriage this way, this is why you're not seeing my power in your lives. This is why you're not seeing the blessings flow out, because of the way that you treat each other in marriage. So here in Malachi 2.14, this is God reasoning uh, through the prophet with the people, why they're not seeing the blessings of God. And he says, but why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with the portion of the Spirit in their union? So this passage supports what Jesus said in Matthew 19 regarding God as the one who joins two people in marriage by covenant. So uh, the Bible tells, you know, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it tells one tale about what marriage is. It doesn't, in one sense, it doesn't evolve. Uh, you know, we see bigger pictures of it as far as what it represents. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, but marriage is defined straight through, from the beginning all the way through redemptive history uh, up to Jesus and even beyond. Notice that God is the covenant witness between a man and a woman in marriage. So their promise is not merely to each other, right? When they look into each other's eyes and they speak those vows, it's not merely to them. It's not merely to the minister or to the wedding official or to the people in the audience. It's a vow and a promise to God ultimately. Tim Keller explains, he says this, he says, Why do we say that marriage is the most deeply covenantal relationship? It is because marriage has both strong horizontal and vertical aspects to it. In Malachi 2.14, a man is told that his spouse is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Proverbs 2.17 describes a wayward wife who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. The covenant made between a husband and a wife is done before God, and therefore with God as well as the spouse. To break faith with your spouse is to break faith with God at the same time. So, up to this point in creation, okay, we're still in that part of the narrative, we can make several affirmations and denials about the nature and original design of marriage. First, and most importantly, it is God who has created, designed, and defined marriage. Okay? It is God who has created, designed, and defined marriage. And this is so important because um, I, I apparently do a lot of, uh, I guess, cultural apologetics with a, with a friend of mine. Um, marriage is not something that was invented late, like in the, in the Bronze Age or something like that, okay? Marriage uh, was instituted from the very beginning of creation. It was not late development, okay? Now, did people misuse marriage in, the, in, those, you know, in, the, in those different time periods? Sure, you know, of course they did, because the presence of sin was already in the world. But that does not mean that that's when marriage was created. That's not when it came into being. It was in there... Uh, it was designed from the beginning. Okay? So that's, that's definitely important for Christians to know and for Christians to affirm. Okay? So marriage is not for us to define. This is the exclusive right of God as creator. Secondly, marriage creates a relationship that takes priority over all other human relationships. Okay? Marriage creates a priority that takes uh, that, that, uh, that places it above all other human relationships. In this text, we read in Genesis 2 uh, that marriage involves a leaving and a cleaving. Okay? You leave your parents, that's uh, before marriage, that's the closest human relationship, okay? and you cleave to your spouse. You cleave to your spouse. So hence, marriage is not merely one relationship amongst many. Okay? It shouldn't function like that. It shouldn't be equal. Among, you know, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as uh, much of a friend as I, with my wife as I am, you know, with my homeboys or with my peers at work. And it shouldn't be like that. Marriage should have a priority. It was designed to be 
the most loyal relationship. And the reason is so, uh, that marriage is, <coughs> is designed this way, that it's supposed to have a priority, is because marriage is such a defining relationship. Okay, Tim Keller, he likes to say it this way. He says that marriage has the power to change the course of your life as a whole. Okay? What he means by that, and, and I think we've, we, you know, even outside of marriage, you experience this in, ro in romantic relationships, but if your marriage is good, the world around you can be falling apart, but if you have the love of your spouse, if you have their approval, if you're in their good graces, you can still pretty much face it. But if you have a horrible marriage, you don't have their approval, you're unsure of their love, the world around you is going great. That world around you doesn't matter because you don't have love and the approval of your spouse. People feel that even you know even in romantic relationships and dating relationships, as boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, uh, relationships can be that defining. Okay, I mean sometimes I mean we everybody knows it right. Well, not everybody, but you know hopefully. Uh, you can at least know, understand what I'm talking about, but sometimes people, they, they get together and they feel like they're on top of the world because they're with the right person. But then things start, you know, things start getting a little bit bad and stuff like that, and all of a sudden, you know, they're just down and they're gloomy. It's like, what's wrong, dude? You got everything going for you. Hey, don't, for, you know, forget that guy. Forget that girl. You know, and it's just like, you can't, you know, because relationships are designed to be that powerful, especially marriage, especially marriage. So marriage has the power to, def to set the course of your life as a whole. So that's the way marriage was created. It's a very, very wonderful thing that God created. Uh, it's meant to be the peak of all human relationships between male and female. But the fall happened. The fall. The entrance of sin into the world in Genesis 3, it, it, it destroyed the ideal life. It destroyed that. It destroyed Marriage. It frustrated marriage. The essence of the temptation to, it was to be like God, and that autonomy has just haunted us ever since. Part of the cell of the temptation was the question, did God actually say and in relationship to marriage, especially for Christians, right? I mean, here's, here's, the, here's the temptation. Did God really say you can't marry a Christian? You know, there's one that Christians have to deal with, especially nowadays. Especially nowadays. The other thing Satan did was cast out into the goodness of God, causing Eve to believe that God was withholding the best for them by not allowing them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in marriage, you know, where does this play? It's right that God is withholding the best. Well, God hasn't allowed me to get married yet because, you know, and we insert our reasons, right? Well, because when I was in eighth grade, you know, I, I sinned and I cheated on my on my whatever test, you know, and that's the reason why God has withheld things from me. And we put these things on God, like, well, you know, I did this, therefore God is withholding this, and we make God, in our minds, we make God seem like he's not being good to his people. Even in marriage, even in marriage, people can say things, you know, like, well, the reason why my marriage isn't the best is because, well, I mean, there's a lot of sin in my past, and, and you know, um, you know, God has a good reason. I, you know, I understand why he's withholding things from me. You know, I, I haven't been the best person. You know, and, and there come those lies. And those lies usually bring bitterness toward God. The effects of the fall were immediate, bringing guilt and shame. Again, guilt can be defined as feeling bad for what you've done, and shame can be defined as feeling bad for what you are. Now, in marriage, so the important thing, at least uh, we'll get to a little bit more in depth here, is that Adam and Eve, they cover themselves from each other. They cover themselves from each other first. And, I mean, obviously embedded within that attempt at covering themselves from each other is they're trying to cover themselves from God, too. But it's significant that they covered themselves from each other first. Amongst themselves, they cast blame on each other and everything else, including God for their lives. Eventually, this will lead to frustration in marriage and outside of marriage as well. And so they came to realize the hard way that God was not holding anything back from them with his command. Rather, he was protecting them. He was protecting them. The effects of the fallen marital relationship, and this will kind of be a little apologetic excursus for us uh, as well, because I, I, we hear this a lot and... You know, um, we have to know how to deal with it. But one of the things that you see in marriage, 
uh, at least the ruination of it, is polygamy. Okay, in Genesis 4.19, it was uh, Lamech, the, the, the descendants of Cain, you know, he's the first one to take for himself two wives. Okay, big boss, right? Big roller, high player, everything, all that stuff, okay? Uh, now, uh, here, who else took multiple wives for themselves? What do we got? We got like Abraham, right? We got like the moral heroes of the Bible, right? You got like Abraham, you know, he's got, he's got Sarah, well, he, uh, he takes Hagar, it's not so much a wife, but... But a handmaiden, right? You know, uh, you've got Jacob. You know, Jacob's got two wives. You've got Solomon. You've got David. You know, and you kind of wonder, like, you know, because I have people, I, I, have, I have friends that they read the Bible and they read it from a position of unbelief, and they think that that is what the Bible teaches. And, I mean, there have been churches in the past, right? I'm going to leave that one out there. there. There have been churches that have taught, basically, that polygamy is the norm. That that is according to God's designs. I'm I'm starting to do studies on on, uh, on Islam and the Quran, and uh, you know, lo and behold, you know, that's what Muhammad was told to. Yeah, uh, the limit was four. Okay, the limit was four, but uh, Muhammad got a special revelation to take wife number five. Okay, uh, Joseph Smith also got a revelation to take wife number two. You know, all the way. I believe Joseph Smith took fourteen, if I remember correctly. That was the amount of wives that he took, you know, and some, uh, some of the older Mormons, you know, taking more than that. You know what, we have a TV show today, what's it called, Sister Wives? Is that what it's called, that one? You know, that, I mean, it's basically glorifying, you know, polygamy and you try to make it, you know, uh, uh, like, see, it's not that bad. There's just a little everyday drama in their house. You know, I mean, you know the next move, right? The next move is going to be the legal push. You know, well, we should allow polygamy because why? Because society has slowly been introduced to it and has seen the comical aspects of it, and they see nothing wrong with it, and there you go. And that's how it makes legislature. It does not so much, you know, a political process. It's the slow changing of culture that does it. That's the way it works. Um, some scholars have concluded, uh, inspired by Jewish scholar Robert Alter, that the Bible, instead of endorsing polygamy, has a subversive way of arguing against it. Okay, that is, there's a subtle polygamy against, uh, or there's a subtle polemic against polygamy in that those who engage in it usually have something go wrong in their lives because of it. So this is kind of one of those hidden Jewish literary tools, okay? Abraham, you know, uh, he, didn't, he wanted to fulfill God's promise apart from his wife, and so this is also why, why God won't let him leave Sarah behind, you know, when he says, well, that's, Sarah's my sister, don't kill me, please, take her, but... That's my sister, you know, uh, when he's going through Egypt. Uh, but God won't let him experience the covenant blessings without his wife. And then when he, you know, uh, when he has a kid through, through Hagar, uh, there's a lot of trouble. There's a lot of strife in the household, right? There's jealousy that starts to come up between Sarah and Hagar. There's strife. They're at enmity with each other. And so uh, Robert Alter, uh, he suggests that that's actually the Jewish way. It's a subversive way of showing that polygamy is wrong. And that there's curses, there are consequences that come from it. Uh, other people, Jacob's marital strife between his two wives and the two handmaidens that led him to have a favorite son angering his other sons. You know, so Jacob, he couldn't, be, he couldn't even be a good father because of his, uh, in a sense, I mean, really, his inordinate love for Rachel. He picked, you know, her child, Joseph, as his favorite, neglected all his other sons, created a snitch in Joseph, okay, the family tattletale, and that's why his brothers hated him. They hated him for that. It wasn't because he was simply like more spiritual or something like that, you know. He, he, his father had raised him uh, to be his favorite and neglected everyone else. David did the same thing. David, and all, you know, with all his wives and all his children, uh, his inability to govern his own household. He had too many kids, too many wives to keep track of. He lost track of it that when, uh, uh, who was it, uh, one of his sons raped his uh, his. Uh, one of his daughters, um, the other son, uh, uh, Absalom, was like, hey, Dad, you going to handle this? And David was just like, that's my kid. What do you want me to do? You know, and Absalom, you know, he's like, well, I'm going to take this into my own hands. And he takes his brother out and says, hey, let's go have a little party, have a few brewskis around the fire, and he kills him. He kills him. He basically exacted the justice on his, on, you know, on his stepbrother that his father, David, wouldn't do. 
And that creates all types of problems for David, right? Then Absalom has to get cast out, blah, blah. The kingdom, you know, goes into haywire. David's running from his son. And why? Too many wives, too many kids, not doing it God's way. But polygamy is one of the effects of the fall on marriage. And so, uh, so you may see it in biblical characters, but you see the curse. You see the strife that comes with it. Something else, uh, the tyranny of men in marriage. Okay? Uh, in Genesis 4.23, uh, Lamech, again, the one who took two wives, you know, he starts his boast. You know, uh, somebody, um, he gives off his little curse, basically. Let me, let me read that for you all here. Uh, but this is uh, Lamech basically being tyrannical in his marriage. And it says, uh, Lamech said to his two wives, it's Genesis 4.23. Lamech said to his two wives, Ada and Zilhah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. I'm going to say it in a Lamechian kind of voice, right? <laughs> Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. Basically, what he was telling his wives, because he's not talking to other guys, he's talking to his wives. He's basically telling them, if you mess with me, hey, if I killed that guy for hitting me on the arm, right? I mean, he, he talked about going overboard, right? You know, if I kill that guy for hitting me, you know, imagine what I'll do to you if you mess with me. So there you see the tyranny of men in marriage. This can come uh, through abuse, through neglect, through power and control, and through many, you know, many different other ways. Um, part of the flip side, you know, uh, to this sort of thing is, is one of the curses that was on the woman in Genesis 3.16. You know, uh, what it says, it says that... Uh, her desire would be for her husband, but her husband would rule over her. So there's this sort of flip side, almost a sort of dependency where the, the woman would strive, at least most commentators take it this way, that the woman would strive to try to rule the relationship, to rule over her husband, but in the end, the man uh, would, uh, would rule over her, uh, whether, and again, whether it be through physical dominance or these sinful sort of ways. Um, but uh, on both sides, there was, there's some issues... Uh, that go on there. Uh, marital strife, okay, blame shifting and distrust, and distrust, okay, notice that uh, in this respect, again, this is where they hide their private parts from each other. They hide their intimate parts from each other. They went from being uh, fully trusting, being naked and not ashamed in each other's sight, okay, and they were sharing each other's debit cards, right? They were sharing each other's checking accounts. They were sharing each other's cars. They shared each other's toothbrushes, Okay, it was that secure back then, right? You didn't have to worry about anything like that. Okay, uh, but now, now you know, once sin entered in, they just hid everything, and it was like, no, I mean, we'll use the common one there. No, you you can't see my bank account. You know, no, you can't see my checkbook. No, you know, you you can't know what I do at work. No, you can't know this. You and and they they started kind of building these walls around their lives and hiding themselves from each other. And basically, they would kind of come out, you know, whenever they needed something from each other, you know, something mutual, you know, I need a ride here, there, all right, you know, let the guard down, you know, open the bridge, let them in, okay, whatever. You know, and do that sort of thing. But, I mean, even then, once they get inside, there's other walls that go up, you know, but that's what happened in, in, in marriage. They no longer trusted each other with each other. Pseudo-marriages, uh, today we see that in cohabitation, common-law marriages, okay, uh, all the way to the complete redefining of marriage between a man and a woman uh, to include now a man and a man and a woman and a woman. Complete redefinition of marriage. And it's interesting. Um, we're in unique times, you know. Uh, you know, uh, up, in, up, until, up until about a decade ago, I mean, most of those ideas, you know, really weren't even entertained seriously. I mean, even in the most pagan of religions, that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. I mean, you know, I mean, you, even if you were in Rome, you know, and, and, you know, and as bad as Rome was, you had a wife, you had a concubine, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, some of the men, you know, they might, they might have a young boy or something like that. They still didn't, they only had one wife. I mean, as, as weird as, as it still is. But they didn't even think about marrying in, in, uh, as far as the same sexes. They didn't even think about that. So we're in a very, very unique time 
uh, in our Christianity. And in, in one sense, this presents a, a unique opportunity for the church to really understand what God has always said. In a sense, to be reinforced about what we understand about marriage for ourselves. Uh, all the way to, the, to this last one. And I'm putting this one up a little bit higher than, than redefining marriage, and uh, hopefully for good reason, but D-I-V-O-R-C-E. If y'all remember the old song, right? D-I, no, anybody? Nobody remembers that old one? Nobody? Well, you'll have to go look that one up. Divorce. Divorce. Talk about jokes going wrong, right? There we go. Okay, but divorce, the complete breaking of the marital covenant vows. This is among the worst, if not the worst, marital sins. Malachi 2, 14 through 16. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. There's some other translations. I want to say it's the King James or the New King James, but it says in there, Malachi 2.16, for the Lord, uh, the Lord says, I hate divorce. I hate divorce. Apparently the Hebrews there are a little tricky. The ESV translates it as, uh, the, uh, says the Lord God of Israel covers his garment with violence. It's sort of the same idea. Okay, it's just uh, the, the Hebrew is a little tricky, uh, apparently. Uh, but God hates divorce because it breaks the oath, because it breaks the covenantal vow that was made between the spouse and God. God himself, I mean, you think about it, right? God himself stoops down to make a man and a woman husband and wife. He joins them together only for them to undo the work of God. This is one of the most damaging moments in a life. It affects all parties involved, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. Okay, so I mean, in a sense, divorce is not something that happens just between two individuals. It breaks up families. It breaks up children. It can break up friends. You know, I mean, I've been part of, in a sense, uh, some of my friends who have gone through divorces where, you know, the, the joke is, is that, uh, I inherited Moses in the divorce, you know, and it's like, okay, I, I guess, you know, um, but they're that damaging. They send ripples, I mean, that, that we don't know where they stop. We don't know where those will end. And why? Why is divorce that damaging? Well, remember the way marriage is designed. Marriage has the power to set the course of your life as a whole. When you become one flesh with someone and then get ripped apart in divorce, that is a huge part of your life. The one flesh that you were gets torn off. It can be so damaging that you lose your very identity in a lot of ways. Now, this doesn't just work in divorce, but even in death, right? Couples that have been together for a long time, and then one of their partners dies, and the other person doesn't know who they are apart from the other person because, in a sense, they fulfilled what marriage is about, becoming one flesh. You know, you, you see this, uh, you know, very sadly um, in older couples, in older elderly couples, and one of them dies. And, and, you know, it's almost a matter of time the other person just kind of slowly deteriorates because someone who's been a part of them, who's defined them, who's helped to shape them, who's become literally one flesh with them, goes away. And it, it's just, it's, it, it's completely earth shattering. It, it's, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> it really is horrible. But that's part of the power of marriage that it has. So that's why divorce is so wicked before God and so hurtful to us. Now, there are tendencies of sin and attitudes towards marriage. Okay, uh, Part of these, we, answer, we ask the question here, why do people tend to put off marriage? Okay, Well, one, uh, they're, product, they're products of broken families. Okay, So here, these are the effects of divorce too sometimes, right? Okay, parents who have been divorced, okay, or children who've been abused, neglected, okay, or they have missing parents in the home, okay, this can disrupt marriage, okay, and they're usually getting into marriage, okay, there's, there can be commitment issues that happen here, 
Okay. Uh, another reason why people tend to put off marriage, especially Christians, young Christians who haven't quite assimilated their Christianity into their dating lives when they begin, uh, when they begin uh, looking at prospects for marriage. Okay. Uh, sometimes that happens when marriage becomes serious, right? When, when, when a relationship gets serious and marriage comes into play. You know, uh, I, I heard one movie. I hope you all don't take this the wrong way, right? Um, <laughs> In this, in this one movie, these guys were talking. They're like, man, my girlfriend, I think she's starting to get serious. Well, how do you know? She said the F word, future. Oh, no! You know, and his friends go off on him, you know. Uh, but, but a lot of times, you know, uh, Christians, uh, uh, when you understand what marriage really is, this is when you start to take it more seriously. You know, you start to respect it more, and all of a sudden, you know, well, the whole, you know, delayed marriage with with uh, with uh, uh, with prolonged romantic experiment, experimentation, you kind of start to put that off and go, okay, this is what marriage is. I need to, I need to shape up about it. Okay, uh, look. So, in one sense, looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend is one thing; looking for a husband or wife is quite another thing. All right, now. Some idolatries, pretty much the same one, uh, the same ones with singleness. Okay, you have an independence idolatry that is my life has meaning and significance if I have the freedom to be able to choose between as many options as I can at a time. So this is the idolatry that seeks to avoid marriage. Okay, that seeks to avoid marriage at least for the most part. Okay, uh, this sort of attitude toward marriage keeps people away from it. However, this attitude can also be brought into a marriage. It can be brought into a marriage as well, okay? And, and people can get married on pretense, basically. You know, well, I, you know, this person thinks marriage is one thing. This person thinks marriage is about having somebody that will do your laundry and keep your house clean and give you a place to sleep so that you can basically live your life and just have a place to stay, okay? And then the person doing that it thinks that marriage is something for, for getting to know another person, for having a life partner. And when you get married, and since I got with two different intentions, it is very possible to bring this idol with you into a marriage if you do not understand the purpose of a marriage. You know, and so what does that sort of marriage look like? Maybe we've seen it among friends. You know, it looks great at the beginning because one or both of these partners are getting what they want from each other. Okay? However, once the partner wants a little bit more commitment, they want a little bit more time, they want a little bit more affection, they want a little bit more sacrifice, well, the other partner begins to think, hey, this isn't what I signed up for. You know, I thought we had a mutual commitment that we would just kind of live together, you know, help each other out and not cross certain lines. But now you want me to love you a little more? Hey, this isn't what I signed up for. I'm out of here. You know, and that happens. That happens. Or, you know, if they stay in the marriage, you know, what does it look like? You know, by the first anniversary, you know, yeah, you can still kind of kiss each other. By the time you get to anniversary number 25 and it's like kiss each other for the picture, it's like, uh, how about we just hug? A, a, a Christian side hug at that, right? You know, you lose affection slowly. That affection just slowly starts to go away. You know, and, and you know, on the other, you know, uh, another consequence of that, too, that can happen uh, horribly, but the reality is that that can also lead to an affair. That can also lead to an affair. The other type of idolatry is marriage as an idol. So this was the dependence idolatry that we that we identified with singleness. Okay, but remember that in the Bible, idolatry does not have to be the desire of bad things. Okay, idolatry isn't just the desire to sin. Okay, idolatry includes the over desiring of good things, especially. This view of marriage is usually fostered in more traditional cultures in which growing up and getting married is not just normal, but expected, okay? And that's definitely down here, you know, in the valley, you know, in Latin cultures and South American cultures and uh, in a few other cultures around the world. It's pretty much just expected. You're supposed to get married. And if you're not married by a certain age in those cultures, you get outcasted, you get shunned. People start to think, hey, what's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with that person? How come nobody wants them? You know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's the way those cultures sort of work. So a person like this in their heart of hearts, there are those who, uh, who place marriage as an idol. They say things like, my life will have meaning and significance as soon as I can find a spouse. 
they'll say that. Or even in marriage. In marriage, it sounds like this. It says, now that I have a spouse, now I know who I am. Now I'm somebody. Now I know that I have all the love and the security and, and, the, and, and, uh, uh, and, and the happiness that, I'm ever, that I've always wanted, that I'm ever going to need, because I have a spouse. If I could just have the love of, and you insert name, right, okay, then I will know that I have made it in life. And you see this in the Bible. And Jacob is one character. Okay, Jacob, as soon as he sees Rachel, he doesn't even know her name, doesn't even know what her voice sounds like, nothing. He just sees her, and, and, and uh, he becomes macho man all of a sudden. You know, it takes four guys to lift this boulder uh, off of the well. He does it by himself. And you're like, wait, this guy's been raised in the kitchen all his life. <laughs> And all of a sudden, he's lifting boulders. But, you know, that's what love did to this guy. That's what love did to Jake. I mean, so he sees Rachel, and he's like, you know what? Let me do it. Let me show you how I'm going to get it done. You know, and he works 14 years for her. 14 years. And says they felt like a couple of days because of his love for Rachel. But then what happens? He gets married, and it's not all that. You know, all, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, at least before that, you know, uh, sin promises one thing, but in the morning, it's Leah. You know, uh, somebody named Leah in here, hopefully. Uh, that doesn't offend her, but that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, sin promises one thing, but it delivers another. And he keeps going, and, that, and then he finally gets Rachel, and then Rachel can't bear children. And Rachel now becomes, you know, the thorn in his side. Give me children or I die. You know, and Jacob gets so frustrated with her. He's like, my God, I, I can't give you kids. You know, leave me alone. I, I can't do it. You know, and, and so it, it wasn't what he expected. You know, another one in that same story was Leah. Leah, I mean, she had to agree to something to, you know, hey, uh, hey uh, Leah, now I know this is going to sound out of the ordinary, but uh, we want you to marry, uh, marry Jacob, and we're going to put you in place and trick him, and uh, we're going to say that you're Rachel, you know. Well, why did she go along with that? She was looking for love. She was looking for love. Compared to her beautiful sister, Rachel, Leah had weak eyes, or soft eyes, as some translations say it, she wasn't getting, uh, uh, she wasn't getting any, any hits on her eHarmony account, right? Her match.com had been inactive for who knows how long, you know, but she wasn't getting any hits. And so this was her only chance at love. And in her story, uh, you can read about it in Genesis 29, she keeps having kids, right? She has Reuben, and then she says, now I know my husband will love me because I've, I've, I've given him a son. That's what every man wanted back then. You wanted a firstborn heir. You wanted a male heir to carry on the family name. And Jacob's just kind of like, meh. Okay, well, let me have another one. And she has another kid. Now, this time, my husband will love me. Me. Okay. You know, a third one. No. Leah has to end up having a breakthrough with her force. And she has to come to realize that, you know what? Nothing she does is going to win her the love, the security. And she's using, she's using Jacob. She's using her own kids to find her own fulfillment here. She's using traditional means. This doesn't mean that marriage is a bad thing or a family. That's, uh, that's not the point. The point is, is that those things shouldn't be everything. Those things shouldn't be the foundation that you build your life upon. Another form of idolatry can be what uh, St. Augustine called inordinate love. When you love things more than you're supposed to. Inordinate love. Whenever you love something more than God, that thing is an idol. That thing is an idol. Marriage, a husband, a wife, children, even family, they cannot bear the full weight of your soul. Only God can do that, and only God has done that in Jesus Christ. So on a side note for Christians, uh, there, there's also what one Puritan called the potential danger of a good marriage. The potential danger of a good marriage. I forget the name of the Puritan because I didn't write him down here, but he, I think it was Thomas Chalmers, I'm not too sure, but he wrote a letter to a young married couple and he basically told them, be careful about the danger of a good marriage. And I mean, you kind of read that and it's like, wait, what? You know what he talked about? And what he meant was this, basically, he says, be careful that, uh, that finding your fulfillment in marriage, okay, uh, be careful that you're not finding all of your fulfillment in marriage and that you're leaving God behind. Because when that happens, you're in a spiritually dangerous place that will ultimately spiritually bankrupt you or blindside you at some point or another. Okay, It will blindside you at some point or another. At some point when you're really going to need God and you've been building your life on another person the whole time, 
you're going to find yourself empty at some point. So that was another warning, was particularly for Christians, but I thought it was important to mention here. So how do we get redemption? Because we're all depressed right now, the things that have, marriage have become. Okay. Well, poor Leah, poor Leah, she only found her way out of idolatry when she had her fourth son, Judah, whose name means praise. And she acknowledges now in her fourth son, she acknowledges that she's going to praise God. She says, this time, this time I will worship the Lord. That is to say, Leah finally discovered that the true love that she needed, it was not in Jacob, it was in God alone. Leah finally stopped living under the weight of trying to win her husband and found a place where God had won her heart. Essentially, really, I think we need to see this, Leah discovered the gospel. Leah discovered the gospel. In a sense, she discovered a true son who was going to give truer meaning to her life. The gospel is the same cure to the selfishness of the idolatry of independence. Why? Well, because in the gospel we see the most radically independent being in God laying aside all of his own rights uh, and prerogatives to live for others. God doesn't need anybody else to be who and what he is. I mean, he's a trinity. He didn't create us because he was lonely. He was, he was in eternal relationship. So when he created us, he, cre he created us basically in a sense to reveal himself for our, you know, uh, for our benefit, ultimately for his glory. I'm trying to remember John Piper's book, Desiring God, how he puts it in there. Uh, was it God is most, we are most satisfied in him, or God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Something like that, but basically the idea is that God reveals his glory so that we can reflect it right back to him. Uh, that's, that's the sort of idea here. Uh, but in, this whole, in his whole life, Jesus did not live for himself. In his whole life, he lived for others. He lived a life serving others all the way to the cross. In a sense, what you, the person who's living for, the, for this idolatry of independence needs to see that living for yourself is against the very fabric of the universe. The universe itself being, create, being patterned and created by a selfless God, a God who gives. To just take is against the very moral fabric of the universe. Even in creation, again, God didn't create for himself. I mean, he couldn't have, right? He created for others. God cannot add glory to what he already has from all eternity. Rather, he selflessly reveals his glory, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. God is a giver. Now, the gospel also cures our over-desire and idolatry of marriage. The gospel tells us that we are so radically hopeless in our sin, we are also radically longing for deep fulfillment and the desire to be known. But in Christ, we see the one we see that we are radically loved and radically accepted by an all-knowing, all-loving God. In a sense, Christ alone has the most uh, love that is going to fulfill us, that will sustain us. It's not a love that will last for, I, I don't know, how, uh, let's say two years. That's a good long relationship, right? You know? But for a relationship to come in, you know, the, the love to end at two years, you know, it's like, well, that's not enough. You know, Christ has an infinite amount of love. In Jesus Christ, we have the love, the approval, and the attention of the most powerful, most secure, most loving person in the entire world. In Christ, we see God who loved us so much that he willingly laid down his life, not so that we could be less dependent, but so that our dependence might be placed on him to meet our ultimate needs. In Christ, on the cross, we see a God who pledged himself to death to be our ultimate lover, to be our ultimate spouse. So what does the gospel mean for the redemption of marriage? That is, how, should, how do Christians understand uh, what God has done to redeem marriage from the plight that sin has plunged it into? What is the cure for our culture, for the fear of marriage that our culture has, for divorce, for redefining marriage? For the selfishness of sin that destroys and ruins marriages, what does the redemption of Christ have to say to these things? Well, here's what the gospel says. This is from Ephesians 5. Okay, so we'll be there for, uh, for these next few points. 
In Ephesians 5, 31 through 32, it says this, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So this means that marriage, when it was created, it was designed after the pattern of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, God had the gospel in mind first, and then created marriage based upon the gospel. It was designed, that is marriage, to reflect the gospel. It was designed to reflect a God who leaves his home to attain his bride and cleave to her for his lifetime, which is eternity. Because marriage is about the gospel, it follows that being married is also a way to be a sign of the kingdom. Being married is a way to point to the kingdom of God. Remember what we said last week. Singleness is a way of is is one way of saying my hope is not here. I'm waiting for the kingdom to come. Marriage is equally a sign that should point away from itself, away from the the benefits of marriage in this life, to point beyond and say I'm looking to the true marriage in the kingdom that is to come. Being married is a way of showing the world that the gospel transforms and renews marriage in the eyes of the world. This is one of the reasons why Christians are forbidden from marrying unbelievers throughout the entire Bible. This is why God protected his covenant people, right? You shall not marry them. He would always tell Israel, you know, speaking of the Canaanites, you know, and of course there were exemptions. If they converted to their religion, well, then they could. But if they kept their religion, they were forbidden from marrying them. A Christian who knowingly marries a non-believer shows that his or her motive is not mission or kingdom exhibition. Okay? They're not living for the kingdom. One of the main ways, and perhaps the main way, this is Tim Keller, that, uh, that married Christians witness to Christ is to show the difference that Christ makes in a marriage. A Christian single who is serious about marriage should also be serious about marriage. Their singleness. This is also one of the reasons why Christians, you know, in, in a sense, why we have to, why we must object to the redefinition of marriage. If marriage is about the gospel. If we're going to say it's okay to redefine marriage, we're basically saying it's okay to redefine the gospel along with that. That's part of what makes that fight, uh, that war in the culture so important. So that's point one. Marriage is about the gospel. Uh, second point, it's not about you. Okay? It's not about you. Uh, Ephesians 5, 22 through 30. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Now, the language of submission and sacrifice, it tells you that there is, is supposed to be a looking away from one's own needs and a looking to the needs of the other person. That's part of what marriage should be about. Now, I recognize that the language of submission and sacrifice is not at all popular in our culture today. But consider this. If the chief problem of all marriage comes from sin, which is a looking inward to satisfy our own self. That is, if the chief problem is selfishness, if that's problem number one in every single marriage, then the chief cure must involve a looking away from ourselves to the needs of the other person. So in a sense, in the language of submission for the woman and, and the command for the husband to love his wife, each of those involves that the person looks away from their own needs and looks, in a sense, to help the other person. 
that's part of the big picture of that language, okay? So, it, you know, don't let the language, you know, uh, hide that from there, okay? There's really a cure in there. There's really a cure. We can further add on to the list that marriage is not about sex. It's not about social stability. It's not about financial benefits. It's not even about personal fulfillment, okay? It's not about you. It's meant to be a human reflection of God's love relationship with his church. That is, marriage is about God's glory. Marriage is about glorifying God. If you have, if you have no intention for a Christian, right? If you have no intention about glorifying God in marriage, really you have no business getting married for the most part. Marriage is not about your own personal fulfillment. It's about God's glory. So in this way, too, marriage is a ministry. Marriage is a ministry, and it doesn't have, in a sense, it's not done in front of, uh, in front of a congregation behind a pulpit or anything like that. It's done, you're, it's shown off to the entire world. Christian marriage is supposed to be a ministry that the entire world gets a glimpse at. In a sense, they get to see the gospel without words that way. I mean, obviously, you want to preach it to them with words, you know, at some point, but they get to see a glimpse of the gospel without words in that way. Another point, marriage is about making each other holy. Okay, so these are the redemptive aspects of marriage, so keep that in mind. I told you this was going to be like nine sermons, each with three points, okay? But marriage is about making each other holy. Ephesians 5, 25, 27, uh, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Uh, let me say this, right? Marriage uh, brings you into contact with your own personal flaws like no other relationship can. Okay, uh, many people today, they want to marry someone who is low maintenance, okay, uh, and what that means is that they don't require much self-sacrifice, okay, that's the idea behind that, right, they don't take a lot of work, they're the kind of person you can just leave them alone, they can do their own thing, they don't get into your business, there's not a whole lot of drama there, okay, um, uh, this is Keller again, he says, the Christian community of singles generally operates in much the same way. Most candidates are automatically eliminated from consideration on the basis of appearance, status, poise, or other superficial factors. What a difference it would make to our dating lives if instead we understood that marriage is a vehicle for helping our spouse become his or her best and sanctified self through sacrificial, selfless service. We are to fall in love with the glorious thing that God is doing in our spouse's life. We become committed to our spouse's future glory. In a beautiful irony, this view of marriage does provide personal and lasting fulfillment in the long run. So Keller, you know, he's critiquing that unfortunately, all right, Christian singles tend to fall into the way the world views people. Ah, uh, that person... I don't know if they know how to dance. Oh, that person, you know, they don't have the kind of style that I'm looking for. And so, and, you, know, and these are, you know, this happens within Christian, you know, single men and single women, and they just eliminate people, you know, and it happens, right? I mean, nobody, um, nobody tends to find, in a sense, their spouse, you know, in their own church. Let's put it that way, right? Why, oh, well, ah, they're so-and-so, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, you know, and they go looking where usually? In the world. You usually go looking in the world. You know, and, and when Christians buy into that, bad things are going to happen. If two spouses can say, or if two people can say, I'm going to treat my self-centeredness as, uh, as the main problem in the relationship, you basically, you have a prospect of a truly great marriage. Once you can admit that, that your first problem is you. Your first problem is not the other person. It's your own sin. It's your own self-centeredness. You actually have a pretty good chance of a truly great marriage. If marriage and singleness is a gift, remember that God is going to require an account of how we used it like he required an account of the servants who were given the talents of gold. Will we give God a return or will we hide our gift and be cast out as wicked servants? That is, and so again, will you use your marriage to help make your spouse holy, to make your partner holy. Will you use your marriage that way? And finally, the last point, getting into the consummation here now, marriage is only penultimate to the greater marriage to Christ. 
one day Christ will return for his church. He will return for his bride. And when that day comes, there will be no more human marriage. Matthew 22, 30. On that day of the resurrection, they, uh, they will not marry. They will be like the angels in heaven who neither marry, um, etc., etc. In a sense, the sign of the kingdom that marriage is, when the reality of the kingdom comes, you don't need the sign anymore. And the sign gives way to the reality. And so marriage, as we know, it disappears. And, and it will give way to the fully consummated marriage as the bride, the new Jerusalem, comes down from heaven to be married to Jesus Christ. On that day, the marriage that we all, whether married or single, the marriage, the relationship, the love that we've truly longed for will be revealed. The sign will give way to the thing that was signified. So in conclusion, marriage is truly a wonderful thing. Marriage is, is also a gift. Singleness is also a gift. We don't, we don't want to lose that. Uh, but sin has certainly done damage to marriage. We, we cannot downplay that. It, it has done damage to the design, to the purpose, to the intentions. But there are still things of marriage that don't go away. The power that marriage has, the power of relationships that, that people can wield over us, that we can wield over them, that doesn't go away because that's just part of the design. Those who do not seek the ultimate marriage will be single for all eternity and be cast into outer darkness. So in a sense, you know, and this is part of the gospel that we hold out to the world. In the end, I mean, we basically say you'll either marry Christ or you stay alone and you stay single. Christians who seek to enter into marriage one day should begin to prepare for it in their singleness and not wait until you're married to begin to have a great marriage. Again, remember when you say the words, I do, nothing magical happens at the altar. Okay, there's not this, you know, uh, darkness that, that appears all around you and this one glimmer of light that comes down on you and you just receive all the powers from God to, to be faithful and to be selfless and stuff like that. Those things start in singleness. In your singleness, uh, your personality and your character flaws can, uh, your flaws can seem minimal, but marriage will magnify your sin for you and, uh, and to your spouse like nothing else can. Let me...